Okay, so uh, yeah, like I was mentioned, I work at KPMG, the advanced analytics team. And uh, I've been working there for about two years now. And in the um, last six months or so, I uh, had the opportunity to work together with another department of our company, which is the sustainability department. Uh, so we had a project together with these three people. Uh, that's me, of course, and then Rose in the middle, she's a colleague of mine, also from the advanced analytics teams. And then Lotte, and Lotte is from sustainability. And uh, Lotte does a lot of work uh, around the sustainability reports. And um, what they do typically is uh, they check these reports for their clients. So a lot of these companies are now not only reporting on their financial information, they are also reporting on non-financial information, like how are they uh, providing to the communities or uh, how are they performing on reducing their emissions. And uh, these topics are becoming much more important in our uh, daily lives and in society. So also you see that there's, this is reflected in companies writing more of these reports. And one of the uh, things that they do is sustainability at our department is that they read these reports for a client of theirs and they basically have an opinion about these reports. They say whether or not this report is good enough to be published. Um, they have some standards that they follow which are called the GRI standards. And um, one of the principles from these GRI standards is balance. And what balance means is that they want to define if a report reflects both the positive and the negative aspects of a company's performance so that stakeholders can make a good assessment about that performance. Um, but the problem is that one person from the sustainability department reads such a report and then it's entirely up to their opinion whether this report is balanced or not. And basically they wanted to ask us, can you somehow make this balance measurable? So we have something more quantitative to present to the client. Um, so we tackled this problem by uh, setting up a case as follows. We had about 800 reports, um, which were about 90 pages each. And we split up the project into uh, three different parts. First part would be to extract all of the text. Then we would focus on getting the different topics out that were uh, talked about in these reports. And then we would also focus on the sentiment analysis. Um, now during this talk, I just want to explain the case that we did. And um, I'm gonna mainly focus on the last part because let's face it, that's the most interesting part. Um, but I also want to touch upon what we did for the first two. So that's what I get into, into now. Uh, for the data extraction, um, like I said, these reports are all written by different companies. So naturally they all have different formats, different colors. Uh, there's a lot of infographics. There's a lot of text on photos. Um, so doing stuff like OCR can be really challenging in these cases. Um, so instead of doing that, we decided to only focus on the reports that were machine readable. That way we could take advantage of uh, uh, packages like PDF Miner to get to the XML of these documents and then get the text out. So uh, we would only get out all the elements that were an actual text box, uh, get the text, and then um, parse these further to do like some cleaning. Um, I won't get into that. There are some really nice examples already out there about how you do basic cleaning in for NLP tasks. Um, but um, this was good enough for our case because we could parse about 29% of our uh, documents that we had downloaded this way. Uh, so it was good enough. Um, then using all of our newly parsed data, we started focusing first on the topic modeling. Um, now one of the reasons that it was important to do this before we did the sentiment analysis is because we can compare our sentiment like in general, that's sort of the goal, but it's much more interesting to also look into the specific topics for the different um, lines of business. Like you would be much more interested in reading about um, emissions from an oil and gas company and maybe a lot more about uh, product management in a retail company or about their HR. So um, again, the GRI has a long, long, long list about all the different topics that people should talk about in the reports. But uh, I try to sort of generalize them in um, these four main topics. So we had economic topics, environmental, social, and other. Uh, so economic, you can think about how do they provide to local employment or uh, our, how does their supply chain look? Environmental is of course about energy efficiency, but also important to separate this from water management and oil and gas. Um, social things are more about employment practices, but also a diversity in hiring, health and safety. 
And uh, the other stuff is more about if they have new tech available that can provide in a sustainable way or corporate governance. Um, we tried a few different techniques, but the one that worked the best for us was just using unsupervised topic modeling using LDA. Uh, so LDA um, gives you a multinomial distribution for um, of uh, topics for each document and then for each topic it also gives you a distribution for each word and it also assumes that all of the words that are in one of those documents are related to each other. Now what this means is that if I give it a document which is a report and I give it all of these different reports that the topics that I'm going to get back is just the lines of business that these companies are in. So I'm going to get back the retailers and the oil and gas stuff. But that's not what we were interested in. We wanted to know the topics that were discussed inside these documents. So basically what we did, we uh, cheated a little bit and we just gave it all of the pages and said, this is a document. Uh, we also filtered out all of the words that were apparent in all of these documents or like were common in most of these pages. Uh, and we did some little bit of filtering on words like uh, company names. So we wouldn't get company specific information back. And then eventually we got about these 15 topics. Again, I tried to divide them in the topics that I highlighted earlier. So we uh, found some business related stuff. You can also see nicely that it's definitely sustainability reports that we're talking about. Um, and of course we saw that in the uh, environmental stuff, we saw again the separation between the uh, water management and the emissions, which was very important for our sustainability colleagues. Um, we saw health and safety come back. Uh, employee training, we also see uh, diversity in hiring, and we see human rights coming back. Um, so this was a really a nice result for us, and uh, having this model now allowed us to basically annotate each page in a report as being part of a single topic, which basically gave us back all of the chapters that they were talking about. So when we had this, it was finally time for the fun stuff, which was the sentiment analysis. Now, sentiment analysis is a pretty um, common use technique already. There's a lot of research, uh, a lot of open source models that actually do this. Um, they are very often uh, trained on Twitter, uh, product reviews. Um, but we had a slightly different question because these reports are from companies themselves and they report on their performance. So no company is going to say, well, our product kind of sucks. And um, when we came to this uh, sentiment analysis that we had to ask our sustainability uh, colleagues, how would you then define uh, your sentiment? What would you consider is positive, neutral, or negative? So they gave us some definitions. Uh, positive would be anything that the company would classify as an achievement or what they stated as overly positive, good thing that they did, uh, boldly stated sustainability strategies. Um, neutral was anything that was just factual or uh, things that were actually a balanced sentence, so it would highlight both positive and negative things. And the negative things were usually challenges or risks that they identified or opportunities for improvement. Uh, now you can already tell that this is a pretty sort of hard distinction to make because even the negative statements are going to be worded positively. And if we're looking at words to determine the sentiment, how are we going to distinguish between something that's worded positively but is actually negative and things that are actually positive. Um, now, I also kind of want to try an experiment with you guys, which is I want to know if you can give me the sentiment for this sentence. So I've set up a Mentimeter. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but it's basically a website where you can go to and you can fill in this code at the top. So the 15, 24, 36. Um, and I just want you to vote. What do you think that this by the definitions that I just gave you is a positive, a neutral, or a negative statement. Um, now this might blow up entirely in my face because I've never done this before, but I'm just really cu curious to see uh, how you guys feel about this. All right. Well, there we go. <laughs> oh no. Okay, I'm so happy. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. So, I mean, negative is clearly raining at this point, but we still see that there are some people that are avoiding neutral or positive. 
also maybe you guys are a little bit biased now that you see the negative going up so much you're like oh well maybe i'll just vote for negative but this was indeed also the problem that we had when we tried to label these things so um thanks very much for your participation um we indeed gave uh one of our colleagues so we were working together with this um one person and basically she set up these uh these sentiments definitions and she also did the labeling for us so by her definition she would go through all of these documents or sentences at least and give it a label uh, positive neutral or negative we then tried to predict uh these sentences using all sorts of different models that were out there we used commercial things like rosetta or the textprocessor.com we used open source uh, solutions like the stanford sentiment tree bank we even tried to train our own model that was uh, argument like uh, added um, with uh, more data from movie reviews um, but basically all of these models just disagreed with each other and we also didn't re see reflected back what we would expect from like what we say that was a negative sentiment a lot of these like negative or positively worded negative sentiments were still coming back as positive um so we needed something else we needed uh, something that could better understand the like subtle distinction between uh, a positive phrase phrased thing and something that was actually positive um so we needed something that could understand context better so we used bert um BERT is a uh, quite recent uh, published model uh, from 2018 by Google. It stands for Bidirectional Encoder Representations from Transformers, which obviously is a backronym, but we don't care. Um, the model is a uh, what they call a language representation model. And basically, it's trained to understand the English language. Um, by now, they also have published multiple language models, but at least at that point, it was an English-based uh, model. And it's trained to predict uh, certain words in text. And that's how it sort of learns to represent English. Uh, but you can then use this model to uh, fine tune your own models for different NLP tasks. And one of those things is obviously classification. Um, what it uses is just a sentence as an input uh, with a CLS token appended at the start of the sequence. And then the uh, representation that it learns over time is then reflected in the node that is associated with this CLS token at the end. So that's that class label that you see. So you can basically just add a classifying layer on top of that, then fine tune your model on your classification. Uh, so that's what we did. Uh, BERT has two different types of models. It had the BERT base and the BERT large. Um, if you want to know more about how BERT works and about what kind of uh, things it uses, I would really recommend use, uh, looking at this, uh, the Illustrator Transformer from Jay, I'm not going to try and pronounce his last name. Uh, it's a really, really good blog post, and it just explains very generally um, how the model works. Um, in our case, we use Bird Base. The difference between the two is basically that Bird Base has only 12 layers, whereas Bird Large has 24 layers. Obviously, it also performs better uh, because it has a lot more parameters. Uh, but for our case, we use Bird base uh, mainly because it's a little bit faster to train and also because I am forever salty that they didn't choose to call this Big Bird because it's another pun and it's missed. They missed this opportunity. Um, so for training, um, we actually used Google, uh, their uh, classifier script. So on their GitHub, they provide you with a lot of examples of how you can do these NLP tasks that they say Bird can be used for. Uh, so we just use that because obviously it's pretty well optimized uh, and it trains pretty fast. So we were not going to try and replicate or improve on that. Uh, basically what you have to give it is a bunch of parameters. How long is your maximum sequence length? What is your learning rate, etc. cetera? Um, you add your classifying layer or the script adds it for you actually. Um, and we train a model. We did also eventually port it to Keras so we had it uh, available in notebooks and that was just a lot easier to work with like even tensorflow now admits that keras is better because tensorflow 2.0 is also going keras um so uh that's what we used for predictions during like uh testing and validation um like i said we got about three thousand sentences from well basically mostly lotte and also a little bit from our colleague fritz um we only had about three percent negative labels and 21% positive labels and the rest was all neutral. Now this is also obviously another challenge. 
because a highly unbalanced data set means that it's going to be hard to find the sentiments that we're actually interested in. We don't care about the neutral stuff. Um, but we trained BERT, brought it to KRS, tried to predict some things, and this is what we got. Um, now, the neutral is obviously pretty high, but that's not surprising. But we were really happy with the percentages that we got for the negative and the positive labels before we were getting 20% max. Um, so this was already a high point for us. And what we were also really excited about is that it wasn't the, when we looked at the confusion, it wasn't um, switching any positive with a negative label. And all the confusion was always between negative and positive, uh, negative and neutral, sorry, and positive and neutral. Um, and one of the sentences uh, that we thought was uh, a difficult one, which you also voted on, was indeed classified correctly by BERT. So it was able to find out that this positively phrased uh, sentence was actually a negative statement, which we wanted to detect. Um, also, in the sprint demo where we presented these, uh, these results, and we were like, well, you know, it's, it's good, but it's not great, but these are the words that it, or these are the sentences that it's a bit confused about, we started off immediately with a 50 minute discussion on whether or not these labels were actually not um, labeled wrongly and maybe the model was correct and maybe she wasn't so uh, consistent in her own uh, labeling. So we were like, okay, but if you're not sure about your labels then how are we going to be sure that our model is doing what we are expecting to be doing and how can we validate that this is actually useful? Um, but we also knew that this model was basically trained on one person uh, who spent two full days just labeling. So we wanted to have a model that was at least as good as um, a model that was at least as good to predict these sentiments as other people were compared to each other. Basically what we did is we asked three other people, can you label a bunch of sentences for us? We gave them all the same sentences and then we compared them to Bert. Now, the overall accuracy went down a little bit, but this is not surprising because we were, this model was pretty heavily biased towards Lotte, uh, so we were expecting some uh, differences, but we still saw that there was um, maybe one or two cases where it was actually uh, flipping uh, what they call the positive or negative sentiments, but everything else was still pretty much on the diagonal. And then when we compared them to each other, they were performing even worse. So. Okay, so what does this tell us? Well, I also like was a little bit curious about how this then looked at um, if you represented the, the words in, in, well, if you plotted them basically. So what I did is remember this CLS token that I was talking about uh, before, which is what you use as an input for your classifier. Uh, these are basically just the vectors that represent your sentences. So I just use these vectors and through some PCA or TSNI over it, so I could plot the things and knew what I was looking at. Um, so what happened is that when you look to these plots, so this is Bert versus Lotte. Um, obviously, the, the more darker colors are the labels by Lotte, and the little lighter colors you see in the back, those are the predictions by Bert. So we can clearly see that well, we have all of our negative sentences down here. Hold on, let me do this. All of our negative sentences are a little bit down here. Here are most of the positive ones, and the rest is sort of neutral. But we do see that there's like one or two sentences that is in between. And when I started to actually like look into these sentences, if they were different, I also sort of thought that Lotta wasn't really super consistent with herself. Um, it's also really interesting to look at uh, Bert versus the other people, and then you can clearly see that all of these positive labels are all in this like big blue blob over here. I hope you guys can see it. If I need to zoom in, just tell me. Is that better? So, okay, so what is the actual conclusion of this? Like, how is this still useful? Well, basically what we discovered is that what they already knew, this entire balance exercise that they do is so much dependent on one person's opinion how can you go to a client and say well your balance is off you need to change this well that's just their opinion and the client is obviously going to have another opinion and then their colleague is also going to have another opinion so what we actually did give them is a possibility to make at least their analysis of all of the reports consistent yeah that's us <laughs> so 
they now have a way to make, uh, actually make something that they can benchmark against each other. So they have a sentiment score for one report, but they also have it for the peers of their clients. And they can compare and say, fun, hey, exact, you're being pretty negative compared to your competitors. So maybe you can you know, um, market it yourself a little bit better. On the other hand, maybe you're being too positive and you need to uh, scale it down a little bit. And we can actually show you that you are because we can compare you to your competitors. Uh, now, another big benefit, of course, is that we have this entire field database now with all of these reports, with their topics, with their sentiment scores. Um, so there's another like whole avenue of other analyses that we can now do. We can uh, track trends in time. We can see that maybe if a company has a change in CEO, does it also mean that the sentiment changes? And how does it change? Uh, is there a trend in different topics that people are discussing? Is there a difference in topics that uh, peers are discussing? Should they be discussing others? Um, there's also such a thing as a GRI uh, award winner for the best sustainability report. It could be very, very interesting to look into if there's like some sort of a way we can determine if you're going to be a winner, like maybe we can uh, leverage that to the client. Um, so currently they are using this database to look at these reports. They have a, uh, this is one report per page and it's aggregated um, for the sentiment and also for the topics. So they can see, this is actually uh, our KPMG annual report, which also has uh, stuff about our sustainability in there. And now you can see this whole big blob over there. That's all financial information, which has no sentiment except this negative one. I'm just, I don't know. Um, also, <laughs> this big uh, giant blob here in the, uh, the front is our disclaimer, um, which is just one sentence, but obviously that's flagged as being a risk. So, um, so they now use these things to compare to uh, their peers. We did a comparison to our uh, competitors, so uh, who are in PwC, Deloitte, um, just to see like how are we comparing to them. And this is very useful for us now to see how we're doing, but also for sustainability to talk to their clients about. Um, are there any questions?